So good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the SOAS South Asia Institute's webinar today. Um, that is a game of power, West Bengal's Assembly Elections 2021. I'm Sanjukta Ghosh, setting the scene as convener and your host for the Sai Sangla, which is a public conversation forum. Um, and today we have the expert panel members. So five speakers each will speak for 10 to 12 minutes in the first round, followed by a brief breakup for 10 to 15 minutes of discussion. And then the second round, uh, we have three speakers who will do 10 minutes, and then we have a wrap up discussion for 15 minutes. And I would request that all participants use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to type the questions um, and preferably with the name of the panel speaker if you want to address to a specific person and the chat function is not to be really used uh, for questions. So I want to briefly explain why uh, we are assembled here today, uh, particularly for those who are new to the region's power politics. The title is drawn from the election slogan, Kala Hobby, which is the power game that we are talking about. And uh, that is really drawn from South Asia's national politics, which is known for a very high pitched drama, emotional investment and demonstration of wealth, conflict and contesting political parties. And there's also competition between an array of new promises. Um, so why, why do we pay attention to the state assembly elections um, that is also happening elsewhere in the country, uh, particularly in the South? Um, and I think the reason why we chose this is because we wanted to bring out uh, through this discussion how states actually have a big role to play in the South Asian region where the, there is power over major issues like agriculture, for instance, a burning question today. There's also industries, health, education, public order, and state public services. So there is a, a kind of a subnational level policy that really impacts on national implementations and relations with neighbors. And ultimately, there is also the foreign policy that gets impacted. So these are really areas which are hugely neglected in any micro analysis of elections, partisan politics, as well as the literature on diplomacy. The Indian state of Bengal is located in the highly vulnerable sort of borderland region. Um, which is, um, which is, a, which is a, actually a borderland region that is identified as a, as a hotspot for communal tensions and violence. And that comes from a historical context of partition and decolonization, which some of our speakers will definitely touch on, that, that is really building up uh, quite ahead of the ongoing eight phase assembly polls. And a target state that is Bengal for the ruling majority BJP as it has steadily progressed in the eastern region of India. Then we have to also consider Bengal's geopolitical importance, which is quite crucial for the central government's relations with its neighboring Bangladesh. There's also very ambitious maritime interest to constrain China in the Indian Ocean region, as well as the Indo-Pacific, again, an area which our speakers will touch on. Bengal is also the gateway to the Northeast, and there are strategic routes in North Bengal connecting to where the world's attention is at the moment, that is the Silk Route economy. In this slide, if you, have, if you can take a, a quick glance, um, it gives you an idea of how the vote sharing has shifted in the state. And um, it kind of sums up a little bit about the majoritarian rule that is trying to target the state as well. So the Communist Party of India, the Marxists ruled the state for over three decades until the current Trinamool Congress under its leader and CM 
Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee won a majority in 2011, which is the year of change. And since India's post-independent period, the CPIM ruled maintaining a kind of distance from the center and the Indian National Congress, except there, there has been some pre-electoral seat understandings in, in about 2016. But currently it seeks to reorient and reposition and form alliance with the Congress that was unthinkable in its heydays. So why is that? And in the first panel, we will begin with Mohammed Salim, who is the former MP and the CPIM Politburo member, who will speak on the repositioning of the left as new power centers emerge with the CPM Congress Alliance. Salim, as this picture shows, returns straight from the ground uh, to join our forum. And it's very late at night in Calcutta on the very last day of his campaign from his constituency. We also have Bengal's decade, uh, kind of a long decade long Trinamool Congress rule has raised the, the anti-incumbency factor due to entrenched corruption, minority appeasement, and despite some popular measures of social protection, um, there's a historically long period of communal stability in the post partition decades of communist rule. And that meant that caste, which is a socioeconomic marker of identity politics. And on this slide, you can see that we've used uh, Professor Shekhar Bondavada, who is going to talk on caste, his take on caste as a cultural marker. So that is something that, uh, you know, Bengal has always looked upon caste as a, a factor that never really mattered so much in politics, because it is divided between the rich and the poor. So Shekhar Bandhapadhyay will speak again on the repositioning of caste, just to continue the dialogue that Salim would start on, um, to look at uh, caste at a time when citizenship legislations are really inspiring this new politics of hope. So the Bharatiya Janata Party challenged the ruling Trinamool since its election in 2014. And even more after winning a majority in the parliamentary Lok Sabha elections of 2019, it's all kind of set to do away with the conflictual federal relations that characterized the state governance of Bengal in the last 44 years. So we have three speakers that who will talk about this kind of electoral politics in the light of development and its regional impact. Professor Maitesh Ghatak on political and economic trends over the last two decades. Dr. Indrajit Roy on the battle for Bengal, regional resonance, Bengal assembly elections and development. And finally, Dr. Subir Sinha on West Bengal's election campaign as the civil war and how the BJP creates its support base. Our final round uh, will be really to sort of look at the um, the kind of the emergence of Mafassal Hindutva and the crisis of Padralok with reference to Bengal's uh, community, communal level polarization and with reference to social media as well. We will also touch on various issues of contentious federalism uh, in the context of uh, neighborly relations, particularly in relation to China. And for that, we have three speakers Again, Shanawaz Ali Rahan joining from Oxford University, Ipsita Haldar from Jadavpur University, and then finally Ambar Kumar Ghosh from both Observer Research Foundation and Jadavpur University. I will obviously introduce a little bit more when they come individually to sessions. But with that, I want to really turn to Mohammed Salim and uh, he, will, uh, he will start the discussion. Uh, straight away. Thank you. So over to you, Salim, or I think you have to unmute. Yes. Now it's audible. Thank you. Yeah. Is it audible now? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Sangeeta. Uh, first of all, because of the invitation extended to me, and now the co-panelists, uh, they will 
just excuse me because of my sore throat. You know, straight from the campaign and battlefield, I'm reporting to you. Uh, first of all, as you, your point is, game of power. So with these two words, Kalahabe means game by the TMC, the ruling dispensation in Bengal, and the power that is representing the central government and BJP. So on the one side, it is power, muscle power and money power with this electoral bond, huge sums amassed, forget about PM Cares Fund on the one hand, and the gangsters, the goons, which were earlier with the Tinamul Congress. Now, Mamta Banerjee herself is blaming Subendu that he, he was the culprit. I'm not going into that. But those type of Arjun Singh, Jitin Tiwari, all these regional uh, powers with muscles, uh, they are with the BJP. Thirdly, the power of this divisionary tactic with our uh, Home Minister and the helm of the affairs. So from the beginning, for the last few years, we have seen how this divisionary politics is at work. I'm not entirely blaming BJP because they are known to uh, for this entire country, but particularly Tirumal Congress, with whom many liberal, secular, democrat, progressive forces have reposed their faith on Tirumal Congress because of the high dramatics that as if Mamta Banerjee is taking on the BJP, uh, but even when the BJP was not there, uh, uh, as a natural ally, as she claimed in the BBC interview, mm. she went with the uh, BB, BJP when uh, uh, Atul Bihari Bhattay was the Mukhauta, or the mask, at the end, by the end of the last century. So now in this 21st century, we have two decades, really. one decade governed by Buddha Bhattacharya, uh, led CPIM, led left front government, and another decade by TMC led. So the first decade you see, how the Bengal was progressing on the question of uh, consolidating its strength uh, on the ground at agrarian, uh, through agrarian reforms, uh, in, in minor irrigations, and after converting these uh, crops, to two crops, the three crops, uh, field. education, particularly uh, education of this professional education, uh, vocational education, besides this general education and industrialization. The second decade, when this began in 2011, people expected that something more is going to happen. But in how you see the sliding of Bengals in all respects, be it education, health, or industrialization, et cetera. So there's a disenchantment among the people in Bengal. Uh, this grassroots level democracy, uh, which was uh, symbolized with Panchayat Raj system, with all its errors, uh, but still there was a decentralization of power structure. So it's an over-centralization of power. Then democratization of the society, which was going on through this one third reservation for the women, and then SCSTs and all these marginal sections coming through this grassroots level administration and governments, that has been jeopardized because of this entire Panchayati Raj election system and its election uh, went uh, heavy in this last one decade. Thirdly, this goons, the lumpenization of politics. When the opposition was asked to just keep mum. So the attack on democracy in all spheres, that gave rise to this whisper campaign, rumors, which WhatsApp University, Facebook, which, which now which, uh, you are talking about this Mufassil Hindutva. So through WhatsApp University, this hatred was propagated. When Buddha Bhattacharya was not allowed to hold a meeting in 2011 August in Hooghly, uh, Mohan Bhagwat was invited to address a rally in Malda and with all state patronage. This is the symbol. So how this BJP grew over time. That apart, in this assembly election, so people wanted an alternative. In 2019, we always it is being compared 
just 2019, many people who wanted to get rid of the Trinamool Congress and with high, 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 high pitch Modi campaign and Balakot, Pulwama, uh, the division, uh, people thought that they, uh, it's not pushing the button on the EVM, pushing the button of nuclear uh, uh, arsenals so that Islamabad or Lahore is going to be bombed. But that's a part. Uh, actually, there's when the anti-incumbency factor of Trinamool Congress was already set in, now with this agrarian uh, crisis, uh, this economic crisis, after corona, lockdown and unlockdown, several phases of lockdown and lockdown, uh, the, the, the problem of marginal, uh, this marginalized section and the migrant laborers. So the anti-incumbency of BJP is also setting in, which the mainline media has entirely uh, blacked out. So people wanted an alternate. 2019, the Congress and the left could not come uh, into an alliance. So that was a, a you know uh, dis a disillusionment with the alternatives, which was uh, the Congress or left was talking about. So people reposed faith on the BGP. But this time, for the last two years, we are working hard on the ground level. And it's uh, not only the leaders coming together, but the parties coming together. Now we have United Alliance of Congress, left left alliance with Congress and ISF, the newly uh, floated uh, Indian Secular Front with some tribals, some Muslims, some civil caste organizations coming together. That all, I think some questions will be raised on that. So I'll, I'll answer that on this when question answer session is there. To cut into short, CPIM for last one decade and the 2011 itself on record, we said that we want to revamp our organization, we want to reposition it, revitalize it, and with this revitalized CPIM, uh, with painstakingly we are at work when thousands of fake cases, our comrades were falsely implicated, ousted from their house, oust, ousted from their livelihoods, and molestations took place, attacks took place, and many people wanted uh, to lure the cadres and the leaders. Some, of course, one or two defection was there, but mainly that there are the political parties' offices were sealed by the goons and gangsters. So we have taken this opportunity so that we can revitalize our party, renew our bonds with the younger generation, and with one decades of failure and disillusionment, that there's no employment at all. If there is employment, there is huge corruption. So the new sections have come out. They were not allowed to enter into the college premises, university premises. Well, AVP were there, uh, RSS branches were being held. But with this, uh, going back to the root, the root uh, with the communists in Bengal, pre partition days in 40s, we have seen how you, the, the, those who are being attacked, they can just side with those who are at the receiving end. And during Corona period, lockdown period also, when the big two political parties were locked out, our people with the Shomajibi canteen, uh, the steep canteen, uh, there's uh, relief operations, online health services, uh, extended services which state is, was supposed to do, but the, neither the central government nor the state government took any, any uh, you, know, you know, bother to take any uh, steps to mitigate the sufferings of the common people. So the left could find out its own rules. And that's why during Brigade Valley, I said, the spring has arrived, and it's a set of new leadership has come out. The BJP cannot boost with that, you know, that kind of cadres. The TMC cannot, whereas people are saying BJP has given rise to some hopes. But where are the younger generation with them? They're post only from the 79% of the TMC candidates, are BJP candidates are from BJP. But we have our own homegrown, this Menaxi, this Shijan, and all these new generations leaders, those for 10 years who have struggled hard and with this we have uh, appealed to the people for all those who are not going to be bought by BJP or not going to be sold to Trinamool Congress they have come together and it's a new hope even though the mainline media has not allowed us to make our views heard by the people but with this alternative media social media and physical movement at the grassroots level we are doing hard. But still, there are sections, as you, in your panel also, you have just, we are discussing that is civil caste sections, tribal sections, with the RSS network, 
uh, they they are anti they, they have what they did is anti tmc or anti mamta factors was converted into anti muslim uh, factors and this was done by both that's why you say bj mul the tmc uh, with his utterances which is an, with her announcements with her dramatics has shown that she has she is ready to convert into uh, become a mamtaz begum and rss took this chance and painted her as mamtaz begum so anger against the tmc or the smith deals was converted into the anger into against the muslim that's why our sangeetto morcha's basic philosophical concept was to bring in social factors bring in the sub caste and minorities together so that we can take on this bigam Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed Salim, uh, for your very insightful comments straight from the ground. And you know, you are in the thick of elections, election campaign, and and I hope you stay uh, at least till the end of this first session, so that we can ask you some more questions. And I certainly have some already. Um, I want to invite Professor Shekhar Bondpatai, who is the emeritus. professor of history victoria university of wellington and the former director of the new zealand india research institute to present us and tell us about caste and how how caste politics is actually repositioning in bengal over to you professor shikhar bandpadi well, thank you very thank much thank you sir yukta for for inviting me to speak um, in this panel west bengal election is getting interesting by the day as we move through different phases and since last two election very unlike west bengal the caste question has become very important in this election as well as it was in the uh, last 2019 parliamentary election but more so in the 2011 um assembly election actually the caste question did not play a major role in west bengal electoral politics for a very long time until since uh, the first election 19 in 1952 but the caste the caste issue never disappeared although we did not see that issue being discussed too much in the public space in this election regarding caste question there are two issues which are most important and being discussed from various angles one is the question of the motua vote and the other the question of the extension of the obc list uh, to bring in certain castes um particularly targeting the mahishas let me start with the motua story i mean and this motua story had been important for since last few elections and um, one has to remember the motua is not the name of a caste motua is actually the name of a religious movement an oppositional religious movement mainly which st- started um among the dalits particularly the namashudras of east bengal um it was started by a namashudra saint harichar thakur and it was given a full shape uh, by his son guruchar thakur and he organized the local namashudras who were very powerful in the east bengal countryside into a movement and they participated in politics as well and their politics was mostly autonomous during the colonial period until the 1940s in the mid 1940s as the partition politics started um this autonomy of organized dalit politics in bengal uh, began to lose its autonomy it was divided on the partition question one group under jogen mandal they joined dr ambedkar all india shrew caste federation but another section uh, mainly the motua section which was then under the leadership of the grandson of guruchar thakur pramodharanjan thakur or pr thakur um, moved towards 
uh, the partition campaign, which was instigated by Hindu Mahasabha and the Congress. And Pia Thakur later on joined the Congress. And when the partition actually happened, they migrated uh, to West Bengal. But the majority of the Namashudra peasants did not migrate at that point of time. They migrated only after the riots of 1950. From 1950 to 1957, there was a mass exodus of Namashudra peasants from East Bengal to West Bengal. And these Namashudra peasants, when they came to India, they did not have a very fair deal. Many of them, majority of them were put in refugee camps. And then from the refugee camps, they were sent to different places across the country, mainly to Andaman Islands and to Dandakarana, which is spread bit, uh, in several states, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, etc. But also a large section who just crossed the border and settled down in North 24 Parganas and the Nodia district, the two border districts where the, the, the social demography of this district significantly changed. Now, as a result of that, this Dalit movement practically disappeared from public space in West Bengal because these Dalit peasants who were organizing their movement before 1947 now became refugees in West Bengal and their focus both, both Mandal and Thakur, their main focus was now on the rehabilitation question and the refugee movement kind of displaced Dalit movement from West Bengal. But then the, as time passed, nothing happened. The, the, the condition of the, the scheduled cars did not improve. Pia Thakur, for example, uh, was disillusioned with the Congress and he reinvigorated the Motua movement from the 1980s. From the 1980s, he began to regroup this, uh, this Namashudra refugee pe pe refugees who had settled in North 24 Parganas and Nodia. And by the 1990s, they were a very well-organized religious movement. And with a with grassroots level network. And at that point of time, they thought they could negotiate with the mainstream political parties. And they first became important in the parliamentary election of 2009, but more important during the 2011 assembly election, when Mamuta Banerjee discovered this movement and both CPIM as well as uh, Trinamool Congress were competing for the support of the Motua devotees. But in this, Momota had an advantage because she tackled the religious movement very well. She herself became a member of the Motua Mahasangha. Now, Mahasangha was, is a very organized group. If you become a member, you get a photo ID card. So Momota got her photo ID card as a member of the Motua Mahasangha. And at that point of time, the head of the Motua Mahasangha was Boroma or Pinapani Thakur, was the widow of Pia Thakur. And Mamuta in a public meeting touched her feet, became member of the Motua Mahasangha, became one of them. And about 30 assembly seats, Trinamool Congress practically swept the election. But historically, Dalit support for the mainstream political parties in Bengal had always been strategic. They strategically aligned with the political parties, but in order to push their own issues, they could switch loyalty. Now, the problem of uh, the Trinamool Congress was that the main problem that the Motuas, who were mainly Namashuddha refugees, was the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2003. Citizenship Amendment Act of 2003 stimulate, stipulated that only those who had migrated before March 1971 would be given citizenship. Now, what happened after this, whenever these Namashudros 
refugees wanted to have any documentation like Aadhaar card or ration card or a passport, they had to provide paperwork to prove that they had migrated before 1971. And not all these people had sufficient paperwork. And in 2009, some of them were even prosecuted for not for being kind of um, illegal aliens. So the major grievance and major issue around which the Mahasangha, Motua Mahasangha now started to fight was this citizenship issue. Now, citizenship issue is a central issue and Mamata and his Trinamul Congress just could not do anything about it. And then before the parliamentary election of 2019, BJP comes with the CAA 2019, which they say would solve once for, for all the citizenship problem uh, for the members of the Motua Sangha or the Namashudra refugees who had mainly settled in the border districts of North 24 Parganas and uh, the Nadia. The issue is that one major sticking point, one could argue, that Motua is a religious movement, which is an oppositional religious movement, which is anti-Brahmanical, which is anti uh, Vedic Hinduism. So how would they support Hindu ideology? My fieldwork suggests that not all of them situate or position themselves very firmly in a Motua Hindu binary position. So it's a, there, are, there is a space for ambiguity and BJP is targeting that ambiguous space when uh, Narendra Modi visits Orakandi in Faridpur during his last visit in Bangladesh. Orakandi is the bath place of Guru Chat Chaku. Now, this is a huge symbolic gesture which can appeal to uh, the Goshais and Pracharaks of the Motua Mahasangha, and they have their network. So, one could argue that this might tip the balance. Once again, as it happened in the parliament, last parliamentary election, once again in, in this assembly election. But my colleagues who are working in the field also tell me, and this is also my experience, that Motua Mahashanga is no longer a united house. Uh, the Thakur family, Binabani Thakur's sons and uh, uh, daughters in laws, I mean, the Thakur family, which lead the movement, the family itself is divided. And there is um, now a very strong Ambedkarite movement emerging from within this group. There are many people among the Motuas who are Ambedkarites. And in recent years, we have seen the emergence of a very radical um, uh, literary movement. And this literary movement is also located in the same area of North 24 Parganas Nadia, which is the main base area of the Namashudra Motuab uh, refugees. And um, my reading of the situation is that many of them know very well that the paperwork that will be required for the CIA and the uh, follow-up of NRC regime uh, will not really solve their problem of citizenship as they are expecting but it will depend on how other political parties can convince them about this. At the moment, what I hear from the ground that there is a kind of blind faith that once the CAA 2019 uh, come, their citizenship problem will be over. Uh, so it will depend on how the other political parties can mobilize these people. But it is also true that this this more non-BJP vote, so to, so to say, will be split, will be split between the um, Trinamul Congress on the one hand and the left Congress or uh, the Shangjukta Morcha uh, alliance on the other. But I would suspect that majority of these votes, of these votes would go to TMC because of late, I was referring to the literary movement, this literary movement made a big issue 
of um, the Moorish Happy incident of 1979, when the left front uh, government evicted thousands of Namshudra refugees from the Sundarbans and sent them to Dandakaran. So of late, in the last few uh, year or two, this issue has been had been uh, quite widely discussed among this group. So I would say, instead of left, this vote would go more to the TMC. For in my view, it's too difficult to call. Um, there is a very strong um, possibility that in at least 30 or 32 seats in this area, um, this uh, citizenship issue and the BJP's promise of solving these issues through the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019 might be a good big factor. The other issue which is being discussed is the extension of the OBC list to incorporate the Mahishos, Tilis, and some other group castes. But I hear that the main target are the Mahishos who are very demographically very uh, powerful in Eastern Midnapur, which is now politically very, very significant. But the problem is um, that Mahishos, I mean, historically they change uh, a section of the Chashi Koibortos changed their nomenclature as Mahisho and got that uh, new nomenclature recognized in the census of 1911. This was mainly a movement by an upwardly mobile group. But this group, the Mahishos, from the very beginning, from the early 20th century, was a very diverse group. It included, on the one hand, large landed magnates and small farmers in Midnapur as well as industrial entrepreneurs in Hara and industrial working class in Hara. So it was a very diverse group and it had an upwardly mobile, politically powerful counter elite who did not like to be leveled as depressed classes, which was the earlier name of the scheduled caste because of the social stigma attached to it. And even today, um, this group is not united around the issue of OBC, although I would suspect um, a section of them, mainly the lower middle classes, um, would look at the advantages of reservation, but they are not at all united on this issue and never before Mahishos or any other OBC have voted as a united um, vote bank. So it is highly unlikely that they will do this time, particularly because both DMC and BJP have promised to include them um, in the OBC, new extended OBC list. So whichever they vote that their entry into the OBC list is guaranteed. So it is unlikely that it would um, kind of influence their voting pattern, but only time will tell. So to sum up, I'm really interested to say that after a gap of several decades since independence, since the first election of 1952, the caste question, or I, let me put it in this way, issues that are specifically related to Dalit and OBC communities uh, are again becoming important in electoral debates. And um, what will be the actual outcome of this debate in terms of the results of uh, the assembly seats, uh, it's, I believe, still too difficult to call. Some people are saying that Motua vote would go to the BJP and it will be a clean sweep. I still have a doubt about it because there is a, still a very strong constituency uh, which will not go the BJP way. So let us see what happened. So I would like to stop there and I'll happy to later on respond to any specific question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shekhar Vandapada, who is also uh, with us joining from New Zealand. I, I definitely mentioned that. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a delight to have you because it's, it's a way of traveling back in time and looking at how definitions of caste is also changing with the new citizenship bill is also the issue of the uh, the OBC and so we will you know we will hold on to some questions towards the end I hope you can stay with us uh, for the questions um, turn now to the changing vote and the seat patterns 
among the major political parties over the last three um, assembly as well as the Lok Sabha elections and touch upon the economic condition of the state over the last two decades. So political and economic trends over the last two decades by Professor Murtij Khodak, LSC economics professor and fellow of the British Academy, if we can have you on the floor. Thank you. Uh, you've got to unmute your thing. Thank you. Thank you, Shangjit, uh, for the invitation, and, and, um, and I'm really happy to be part of this uh, very diverse and interesting panel. So without much ado, I want to get to, um, um, you know, uh, play to the stereotype of an economist and, and throw in some numbers in, in, in terms of, you know, both the vote patterns, seat patterns, as well as some patterns of growth that has happened over the last few decades. I think the previous two speakers set the political um, uh, picture in terms of the uh, triangular contest that, that is uh, happening and, and, and some of the salient issues, uh, which um, at least a, you know, some of them happen to be unfortunately divisive and therefore we all watch with anxiety as to how, how, how this is going to play out. And of course, uh, Professor Bandhupadhyay mentioned some of the cost equations uh, that are at work here. So I think that, um, you know, looking at some even kind of well-known secondary sources for some numbers can be quite sort of mind clearing, you know, in the midst of the bustle and din of electoral campaigns and, and kind of, you know, opinion polls and, and, and all kinds of things that, that are out there, right? So there's a lot of discourse, a lot of claims, a lot of counterclaims. And, um, you know, there, there, there's a sense in which, uh, of course, we'll find out um, in, in less, uh, in about a month, what will actually happen. So I think what I would like to do in my allotted time is uh, really talk through some of the voting pattern um, in the last two decades, really, if I, if I look at uh, both the assembly as well as the parliamentary elections. And, you know, some of this will come, uh, you know, will, uh, there will not be any surprises in terms of the broad patterns will be known, but there are some aspects of what I'm going to say, hopefully will have uh, some, some, um, you, know, some of, you know, some interest or something that are not uh, so well known. So I think the uh, really striking uh, figure, if I look at um, um, in, in a recent um, uh, piece I wrote for, for, for in The Wire, uh, where um, we looked at some numbers of parliamentary as well as assembly elections. Um, one of the things that the striking uh, facts that if you compare, say, the uh, Lok Sabha elections of 2004, um, then 2009, 2014, and 2019, is the decline of the uh, uh, heft of the left. Uh, essentially, from, uh, say, the total number of Lok Sabha seats in 2004, of about uh, 35, uh, 26 for the CPIM and nine for the other major left parties like Forward Bloc, RSP and CPI. In 2019, this has gone down to zero. Now, again, this is known, but it's still, when you look at a cold uh, sort of, you know, a hard look at the numbers, it does uh, seem like a pretty sharp decline. And if we look at how this stage came to be, in 2009, the seat share had gone down from 35 to about 15, and then 2014, the state share had gone down to two. So the kind of the downward trend was pretty palpable. And then of course, in 2019, it went down to zero parliamentary seats. And of course, the major beneficiary of this seat has been the Trinamool Congress. And from the total number of Lok Sabha seats of about, of exactly one in 2004, uh, in 2019, it is now has 22 seats, right? And in between, they have kind of, you know, they had a high of 34 seats in 2014. So they have come down a bit. And therefore, as much as the rise of the left uh, of the Trinomul uh, from one to, um, you know, 34 in 2014 is striking. Also striking is basically the BJP's rise. If you look at zero seats in 2004, the BJP in the last um, uh, Lok Sabha elections had 18 seats and a vote share of 40%. Okay, that's striking, especially when its vote share was 8% in 2004. 
Now, I will not uh, bore you with all the specific numbers, but since it's assembly elections, it might be useful just to look at uh, the seats of the major parties from starting from 2001. So since it's a triangular contest, look, let's look at the major contenders here. The Tunamul Congress's seats were 60 in 2001. Um, this was uh, um, in, in 2006, 30. In 2011, the election of the Puri was it's of 184. And in 2016, it was 20 to 211. So that's the Trinamool Congress, right? Which, which basically from 30 has now 211 out of 294 seats. And once again, the left had overall CPIM had 143 seats in 2001. And the other major left parties about 50 seats, uh, 49 to be precise. And in back in, in 2006, this has gone down to 26 six seats overall, as well as uh, for the other left parties, it's just six seats. And the vote shares tell a kind of similar story. The BJP's um, a number of assembly seats is pretty trivial still. So if we, since this assembly elections of 2021 that we are in the cusp of are actually going through, in 2001, the BJP had zero seats in the assembly election, which is what it was till 2011. And in 2016, it only had three seats. Okay, so this is just sort of rattling off some numbers where essentially what we see is especially in the Lok Sabha, the BJP has emerged as kind of really the rival to the TMC as the political powerhouse. And the left's position has really uh, been, um, you know, severely diminished uh, in the parliamentary elections. In the assembly election, um, uh, the Tinomol sort of dominance continues, right? So if you look at the 2016 numbers, the left has been severely diminished but the BJP has not really gained this much. Now, I do not, I do have with me some uh, statistics in terms of uh, Lok Shobha seats where their corresponding assembly seats, what has been the vote share of the different parties. So I do have that analysis, which was, uh, you know, um, uh, with me here. And once again, uh, what uh, uh, the pattern here suggests is something interesting. And, and confirms at least one um, um, broad um, uh, conjecture about what is happening to the vote patterns, which is there has been a, a shift in some of the non-attached votes, um, which initially went from the le left to the Trinamool Congress. These are not the committed votes, but the floating votes that kind of swung in the elections and for example, gave the 2011 uh, elections uh, vast majority to the Trinamool Congress. So if you look at essentially the Lushava seats and look at what is happening to the assembly uh, aspects of that, essentially um, there is a shift from um, red to saffron. So clearly some of the seats that have basically, you know, earlier were solid red seats and they held on and they have, did not switch that much to the Trinamool Congress. At least some of them have, you know, increasingly turned a bit to the, uh, to the, to the, um, uh, on the saffron camp. Okay, so this um, essentially what uh, it, 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 it sort of brings me to is the core problem, I think, and that I think is a pretty interesting and general problem that we, we really would not know how will play out until we see the results, which is in a triangular contest, right? Especially given the situation of, of the three different parties, they're very different ideologies and platforms. What will a, a voter, of course, the committed voters will vote for their parties that they're committed to, and the left has, uh, to its credit, launched a pretty lively and energetic campaign, and, 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 and uh, they have filed, uh, fielded a bunch of uh, sort of young and uh, kind of uh, very, very um, uh, um, well-spoken and, 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 and um, appealing candidates, and we'll see how, how, how they do. So clearly there is some uh, positive energy coming from that front. But the reality is, and I, I, I hate to be the person who, uh, who has to say it, but I'm sure it'll come up during the discussion because it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's in the room. It's, it's like, as they say, it's the elephant in the room that we cannot deny that uh, some of the voters who would have been happy to vote for the left if it had a real chance of winning and forming the government are facing the dilemma that to the extent that doesn't happen, what should they do? 
because essentially they will have to choose between two alternatives, none of which are appealing to them because they would have been happy to uh, have voted for the left. And once again, let me clarify, we are not talking about committed left voters. They will vote for the left. They voted for the left even in the 2019 Lok Sabha elections, which were a bit of a wipeout for the left. But there's still a committed voters of 8% even in that Lok Sabha election that voted for the left. Now, the dilemma is the following. So suppose, and this is where, um, at least in the ecosystem of left liberal voters that many of us are familiar with, uh, there's a fierce debate going on between the no vote to BJP campaign, which some of the bam jot uh, would then reduce that to saying that that's basically saying vote to Trinomul. Now, in a, in a, in a, in a two-sided contest, that would exactly be right. If you say no vote to A, that means vote for B. But in a triangular contest, it's not so simple because no vote to BJP also can mean just vote for the left, but you know, do not vote for the BJP, right? Now, the point here is that a left-leaning voter, but who is not quite a committed voter, who has in the past switches, uh, switched his or her allegiance uh, in the electoral and the ballot box, is facing the following problem. The Trinamool has uh, uh, generated a fair amount of anti-incumbency discontent. There are all kinds of um, uh, issues from ranging from corruption to nepotism, uh, to really uh, various forms of repression that uh, led, um, you know, uh, for example, the panchayat elections were uh, quite, um, uh, quite um, uh, led to a lot of allegations of voter suppression and all of that has happened. And therefore there is a very, very strong anti-incumbency feeling that is coming from that side, right? On the other hand, uh, if you look at the BJP, clearly 2014 was when Modinomics was at least of, of some uh, appeal to some and despite some of us who were uh, somewhat in vain working out the numbers and work, you know, kind of trying to say that the Gujarat uh, growth model is really, a lot of it is really um, you know, advertising as opposed to uh, you know, based on solid fundamentals in terms of a growth model and leaving aside the majoritarian politics, just if you look at the economic aspect of things. In 2014, you know, hope was in the air for some folks clearly and that gave BJP the massive parliamentary majority. But in 2019, the BJP was already exhausted. Demonetization had happened. The messy implementation of GST had happened. And even before the coronavirus crisis and, and the lockdown and all the chaos has um, you know, happened, clearly in the national economy, uh, the BJP is not uh, essentially uh, have claims to uh, doing, a, doing a fantastic job. And yet, and this is the puzzle, yet to a lot of voters, the question is, because they're frustrated with what is going on in West Bengal and what is going on with the Trinamool Congress, they're kind of facing this choice between two unappealing choices, right? Whether they want to, uh, you know, uh, vote anti-incumbent, but because they don't expect the left to actually win and own the government, should they go for the BJP? And the BJP, of course, has poured in campaign money, and of course, they have uh, recruited candidates uh, you know, like headhunters do in the corporate world, um, they have, um, you know, um, uh, raided um, a lot of the Trinomul's uh, existing uh, uh, candidates and have now therefore have this genuine phenomenon that when you're voting, I think we even saw some of the memes as to even candidates in campaigns saying, you know, um, um, Trinomul ke vote din when they have really switched to BJP and by mistake, they kind of, you know, they, they've forgotten because if you, of course, change parties frequently, uh, it is hard sometimes to uh, keep in mind exactly where where, where where you. So this dilemma is a real one, right? So, and in a triangular contest, right? And that I think, uh, you know, uh, that there would be, I, I hope that there would be general agreement, whatever our specific uh, conjectures or hunches as to what's gonna happen, as to how this vote will break will be very decisive. So if this vote largely goes to uh, say the bomb jot, right? So those who are uh, kind of in a dilemma, but they said, fine, there's a rejuvenated bomb jot campaign, let's go for them, right? Then there's still this issue that what will be the swing between the anti-incumbency wave against the Trinomul versus the BJP. And to the extent then the Bamjot vote will essentially help either the Trinomul come to power, which I'm sure would not necessarily be appealing to, uh, to the Bamjot voters that by voting their first preference or their general 
genuine kind of, you know, party they support, they would basically split the anti-incumbency kind of wave and uh, help, help elect the Chinamu. But it could exactly flip the other way, that to the extent the anti-incumbency feeling is very large and the BJP might have an edge and some of the opinion polls with all that they are worth and with all the due skepticism that one should have in, in reading them, is showing kind of a you know bit of a, a toss up between how how the BJP or the Chinmul are going to do. They could also have this problem of which way you know if, if they effectively the BJP uh, has an uh, has an advantage, then by voting for the uh, their first preference, they could be splitting the anti BJP vote. So that puts them in a real dilemma. And indeed, um, I, I'm uh, I don't want to uh, sort of you know that there are a number of other things I wanted to say, but in in uh, keeping uh, in mind the time. Uh, constraints and 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 I, I will just mention a few couple of uh, remaining points and 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 end my talk. So the one interesting thing is if I look at these uh, Lok Sabha seats and uh, how the assembly segments of the that they voted, which I said that if you can see a kind of transition over time, I have a feeling that a lot of the anti-incumbent votes could actually go in the BJP direction. So I think there, there, that that is a real possibility. So, uh, and, you know, again, I, I describe how, how what these voters would be. So that could be a real, um, you know, decisive factor based on how they evolved over the last few electoral cycles. And the positive thing, of course, going for the bomb jute is the energetic campaign that they have launched. And, and certainly uh, there's a sort of, a, you know, uh, air of youth, air of exuberance, um, you know, pop, pop songs that are being used, et cetera. We'll see how it all pans out. Now, I just want to end with uh, the following things about the economy though. So this is what the electoral trends are and we see how this sort of, you know, vast middle group who's seen decides election breaks, not the committed left or the committed uh, to normal or the committed BGP voters. If you look at the economy and if you really look at the growth numbers, and again, this is something that um, uh, I, I, is something as an economist, I, I do take a look at and, and, and carefully. Interestingly, West Bengal's growth record compared to the rest of India, if you really compare, say, West Bengal's growth rate in state domestic per capita income and compare that with India's, actually has been below the Indian average for the last decade. You know, we have now enough numbers. So if you really compare these, but interestingly, this was not true. Emily West Bengal actually was ahead of the rest of India for the first uh, part of, of, the, uh, of this, uh, you know, the left front rule in this century, namely from 2000 to 2006, its growth rate was actually strictly higher. So from then on, there has been a dip. So West Bengal has fallen behind. And during the Tunumul uh, regime, that really has not quite corrected itself. Some of the first on economic opportunity, on unemployment, et cetera, that, that the state uh, is facing and the voters are facing is a real one. But interestingly, and this will be my last point, this is growth rates and growth rates have uh, their usual limitations because they are kind of macroeconomic numbers. And if the rich become very rich, the growth rate will still pre look pretty good because growth rate is just total income. So therefore, if you add up everybody's income, whichever um, you know, uh, cent is growing fast will re be reflected in that. In terms of the NSS numbers, um, uh, in terms of uh, per capita uh, consumption, which is a very different sampling base, and you can then compare again West Bengal and other states with the rest of India. Now, the trouble with this is that the Modi government published the 2017-18 NSS numbers, and then they withdrew it, uh, you know, citing uh, some problems, we, which we, uh, we don't exactly know what those are. But, uh, but the point is, uh, uh, before that, there were periodic publications that gave us a little bit of a household level sampling of what is happening to individual consumption levels, household consumption levels. So for measuring poverty, you know, one of the shocking things about India right now is we do not have official poverty numbers after 2011-12, which was the last time, uh, you know, the NSS reports were published and the poverty rates were com computed based on that. So my last observation is interestingly, if you look at this consumption numbers, then even though in the growth numbers, West Bengal hasn't done, you know, well compared to the rest of India, and not just for the last 10 years, actually for the last 15 years, in the consumption numbers, they haven't done so badly. 
Okay, and that's an interesting tension. Now, whether it is because of a number of redistributive programs that are in place, uh, and uh, to be fair, uh, some of them um, also uh, happened in the earlier regime. I think that is in, an interesting dynamics because in, in terms of whether employment generation and growth, that clearly appeals to a certain kind of voters and certain demographics, but whether it's the Kanashtri and various kinds of uh, programs that essentially are, you can call them doles or you can call them transfer or redistributive programs of various kinds. There, I think West Bengal has not done too badly. Anyway, I, I will stop here and I look forward to um, coming back to some of these issues in the Q&A. Thank you, Professor Moitish Ghatak, for touching on some very key points about, you know, growth fetish. And of course, we are targeting sustainable development goals, and these kind of things are also coming up, and how West Bengal then fits into the growth picture. And of course, if that is going to affect the elections. So um, I think the whole issue of development is going to crop up in our next speaker, the battle for Bengal regional resonance. Bengal Assembly elections. And again, the development issue is brought on by Dr. Indrajit Roy, who is the Senior Lecturer of Global Development Politics at University of York. And he has also created a podcast series called India Tomorrow for the conversation on the eve of the India's 2019 elections, which is also forthcoming as a Manchester University Press publication, as I understand. So over to you, Dr. Roy for taking on from where Moitish left. Thank you so much for this very kind information, uh, invitation. Um, it's, I was telling someone it's a privilege to be sharing this, the stage as it were with such eminent names from diverse disciplines. So thank you for thinking about me. Um, I'm going to spend um, a few minutes uh, thinking about the implications of the West Bengal elections, um, not just for the state per se, or for, for that matter, for India, but for the Indo-Pacific region more broadly. And I think that's the take I'm going to take on development. So it's slightly different from uh, Maitrish, uh, but of course he's, he's presented a lot of the material already for, for everyone to have a, a better understanding. Um, I should say I don't have any slides, so um, to audience members, don't worry if you can't see anything on, on your slides because there isn't any. Um, I'm coming to this uh, uh, sort of talk from three different angles. Um, on the one uh, side, I have, um, I'm drawing on collaborative investigations with uh, colleagues on contentions over uh, citizenship that have been uh, uh, made necessary uh, by the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, the second angle that I'm uh, drawing on is the ongoing changes in the global order, thanks to emerging powers in the global south. And that's where the, the, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific link uh, comes in. And uh, the third angle is the interplay uh, between developments inside countries uh, and developments in global politics more broadly. So as I said, the uh, West Bengal elections or the battle for Bengal as it's being called is significant not only for uh, West Bengal or for India, but for the Indo-Pacific region more broadly. And the Indo-Pacific has emerged as a key geopolitical and geoeconomic region in global politics, as I will reflect in a while. Now, I think the first thing to consider really is the, the, the general context in which the elections have been conducted um, and the legacy of what many would call the long partition. Um, these elections have been conducted, conducted among, uh, amid deteriorating relations between, um, between uh, West Bengal's Hindu and Muslim populations. Um, as has already been said, um, religious polarization between the two communities has become uh, acute uh, in recent years as uh, the BJP and the Trinamul have sought to slug it out, so to speak. Um, and the BJP, as has already been pointed out, has tried to extend its footprint in the state um, on the back of discontentment among Hindu refugees fleeing religious persecution from neighboring uh, Bangladesh. Um, and uh, Professor Shekhar Bandopadhyay already pointed to some of the population shifts and the uh, sort of uh, place them in historic perspective. 
Um, in December 2019, uh, India's parliament passed the Citizenship Amendment Act, which, among other things, discriminated between Muslim and non-Muslim applicants for citizenship from Muslim-majority Bangladesh, in addition to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, led by uh, Home Minister Amit Shah, supporters of the legislation frequently invoked the legacy of partition and repeatedly called attention to the persecution faced by Hindu minorities in Afghanistan, Pakistan, as well as Bangladesh. And uh, Amit Shah did make a reference to how Bangabandhu was trying to build a sort of secular Bangladesh, but uh, made it a point also to say how that legacy was not honored. Now, Shah promised parliament as well as audiences uh, during rallies and press conferences that the amendment would be followed by the enumeration of the controversial National Register of Citizens. And so Indians would now have to prove their citizenship by providing certain documents so they could be enlisted in the NRC. Failure to do so could result in detention as an illegal immigrant and possibly deportation, although it's not quite clear deportation to where, and we'll come to that in a bit. Although the legislation was couched as providing succor to the persecuted minorities in India's neighborhood, of course, the BJP's ill-concealed Hindu supremacist worldview is well known, and it has resulted in justified anxiety among critics that the CAA, in conjunction with the NRC, will in fact be used to target India's 200 million Muslims who are not covered under the ambit of the CAA, and they could find themselves disenfranchised and stateless if they are not able to prove their citizenship. The NRC registry is already in process um, and uh, in the neighbor, neighboring state of Assam, uh, we know that it has left nearly 1.9 million, almost 2 million people stateless, a majority of whom are not Muslim, but who would be covered by the safety net of the CAA, so don't have to face the same worries that uh, their Muslim co-citizens would face. Now, as Professor Bondupadhyay just reminded us, the CAA has been largely welcomed by West Bengal's Hindu refugees and their descendants, and it makes sense. Uh, for whom it offers the, for them, it offers the prospect of obtaining and or confirming Indian citizenship. So it's absolutely reasonable and rational for them to support the CAA. As members of communities that have been labeled low caste, uh, and of course, uh, the reference was made to Mari Chapi massacres and, uh, you know, the general sorts of uh, discrimination that uh, they have faced. Um, many of these refugees have faced social discrimination from which the BJP's project of constructing a monolithic Hindu community offers escape and perhaps even equality. We could talk more about the BJP's attempts to create an ethnified Hindu community and the dynamics of what many would say uh, is a secularizing and democratizing uh, Hinduism, which I'm sure will come up uh, in later presentations. Um, but we can pick them up in Q&A if necessary. What's interesting for the present moment is that the BJP has promised to implement the CAA in West Bengal should it be elected to power. And these prospects uh, are straining and have strained Hindu-Muslim relations in what is a very sensitive border state. And I don't think that's adequately uh, sort of, you know, we don't remind ourselves enough um, after several decades of relative communal amity, incidents of tensions between the two communities have begun to rise since this decade. Um, and the surge in intercommunal violence predates uh, Prime Minister Modi's ascendance to power in 2014. Uh, relations between Hindus and Muslims appear to have nosedived since the BJP's re-election in May 2019. Uh, Maitresh has already offered very detailed analysis, but just to pick a key point, uh, the BJP won 18 out of 42 seats allocated to West Bengal in the Lok Sabha, up from only two in 2014. Now, th the Trinamool continues to rule the state, of course, and the BJP's emergence has been the foremost challenge to its dominance, and this can hardly be uh, ignored. The BJP's espousal of the CAA lends it an edge among refugee populations. 
Trinamool's opposition to the CAA has significantly contributed to its popularity among the state's beleaguered Muslim population, which correctly fears it will be unfairly targeted by the legislation. Even a cursory glance at the electoral campaign uh, that we're uh, sort of witnessing uh, suggests the extent of communal polarization that has permeated the state's politics. And anyone who's followed what was going on in Nandigram uh, will know what I'm talking about. The BJP has accused Chief Minister Banerjee of appeasing Muslims. All sorts of epithets uh, have been hurled at her. And she has been accused of striving to create a so-called greater Bangladesh. Such communal polarization bears an eerie resemblance to the religious violence that plagued British Bengal in the lead up to independence, illustrated by such ghastly episodes as the great Calcutta killings of August 1946. It's become very fashionable these days to criticize narratives of Bengali exceptionalism. But remember that Hindu Muslim violence was endemic in this province before the onset of relative communal amity. And I think it's important to remind ourselves of these episodes because I think we've had about two, if not three generations that have actually lived in relative communal harmony. So they don't quite remember what August 1946 was about. I want to now think a bit about the regional dynamic and the regional instability that we are likely to uh, witness. Irrespective of which party wins, this divisive electoral campaign will strain Hindu-Muslim relations for years to come. The religious filter of the CAA is likely to cause large-scale turmoil in the region. Despite Home Minister Amit Shah's assurance that the CAA will not target Indian Muslims and will only be used to identify quote-unquote illegal infiltrators, the onus of proving citizenship rests on the individuals. Furthermore, local bureaucrats enjoy enormous discretion in approving and verifying citizenship claims, leading to anxieties that West Bengal's Muslims will bear a disproportionate brunt while proving their citizenship. There is a Sam in the background. I don't want to touch on that because of the focus in, in this talk on West Bengal. Many such individuals uh, West Bengal's Muslims, uh, will likely be dubbed Bangladeshi nationals. And then what happens? The government may well attempt to deport such individuals to Bangladesh. We don't know because we don't know who or where the deportation will take place. Um, and this is not fear mongering. For anyone who's seen the recent BJP video uh, in response to the um, Amra, Amra, we are not going anywhere. So the BJP had a response to that. Uh, and one sort of line in that video, I think you will, you will probably, it'll come up for discussion, I'm sure, where uh, the singer says, Khejur bechte eshe cho, tumi ei matir ki jano. And there's a reference, there's an image of an Arab on a camel in the background. Everyone knows that's a veiled threat. So it's not just being alarmist. Such moves obviously will exacerbate tensions between um, the two communities, especially if India begins to identify such Muslim individuals it claims are illegal infiltrators and seeks to deport them to Bangladesh. As president of the BJP back in 2018, Amit Shah himself invoked such dehumanizing imagery to describe these illegal infiltrators. He referred to them as termites, among other things. And of course, it was a remark that prompted swift response from Bangladesh. Now, in the absence of any reliable data on the actual number of illegal immigrants from Bangladesh in India, both countries are likely to contest any claims on this issue. There are few reasons to expect Bangladesh to accept such individuals as its own citizens. Uh, Bangladesh's Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, politely indicated as such. The NRC, it's CAA, she said, is not necessary, but she also said it's India's internal matter. Why would Bangladesh oppose this? For one thing, such movements of population, and this will not be the first time that such movements of population have happened, but such movements of population today are likely to strengthen the growing Islamist social movements in Bangladesh, not something that Sheikh Hasina would want. Second, Bangladesh already hosts thousands of Rohingya refugees from neighboring Myanmar, 
and is unlikely to be able to cope with any more strain on its resources. Its impressive recent economic development notwithstanding, the Bengal Delta is ecologically fragile. It's especially vulnerable to the unfolding climate crisis. Bangladesh already faces an internal migration crisis due to climate change. Population transfers from West Bengal are sure to destabilize relations between in Bangladesh as well as relations between Bangladesh and India. And now I want to think a bit about the larger region of what is being called the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, you can expect unstable relations between India and Bangladesh to hinder the success of the emerging visions of this Indo-Pacific region. Uh, it is an idea that was first conceived in 2006-7. And of course, now everyone talks about how Trump and Biden have sort of you know, invented the term, but the term has very subcontinental uh, uh, origins. It could be credited to uh, Dr. Gurpreet Khurana, who is an executive director of India's Narit National Maritime Foundation and a captain of the Indian Navy. Uh, who coined it as an expression of shared anxieties that India and Japan have over China's rising assertiveness in Asia and beyond. And of course, with the United States becoming interested in exploring alliances in the context of its own competition with China, this term has now gained geopolitical significance. Despite varying interpretations, I mean, everyone has a different take on what the Indo-Pacific means, but most considerations are based on imagining the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean as one contiguous area through which a majority of the world's goods and energy supplies are transported. Many observers have perceived the Indo-Pacific as an alternative to the multi-trillion dollar Belt and Road Initiative that crisscrosses Eurasia. Barack Obama uh, had outlined plans for an Indo-Pacific economic corridor during his second presidency. Donald Trump extended this vision when he declared his support for a free and open Indo-Pacific at the 2017 Asia-Pacific economic cooperation. And nowadays people are increasingly talking about the Indo-Pacific to replace the Asia-Pacific. And building all those initiatives, uh, Joe Biden recently committed to a free open, secure, and prosperous Indo-Pacific region in a very rare op-ed for the Washington Post, which he wrote together with uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, and Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. Now, Bangladesh is a member of the China-led Belt and Road Initiative and has so far resisted joining the security and development umbrella of the Indo-Pacific. Bangladesh's impressive rates of human development should make it a nat natural partner for India's own rapid strides in economic growth. Uh, Bangladesh has been a valued partner in India's fight against militancy in its own troubled uh, Northeast uh, region. Indeed, India's role in the founding of Bangladesh, well recognized by that country's political elites, could be expected to cement the friendship between the two countries. However, prospects for such friendship and development partnerships are easily threatened as evidenced from recent protests against Prime Minister Modi's visit to Bangladesh. The religious polarization that has been fomented by politicians in both countries threatens to curb not only the development partnership between the two, but also any promise of freedom and openness in the Indo-Pacific. In concluding, um, it's, it's fairly obvious that the results of these elections are likely to impact not only the 100 million people who live in West Bengal, but far beyond. Religious polarization already challenges the framework of liberal democracy in India, as many international and national observers have remarked. The population movements that will be required by the implementation of the CAA, if the government is indeed serious about it, and it sort of brings it to full force, which is likely, uh, and all the reference to the unfinished business of partition should leave us with no doubt. And these are references that have been made by several uh, members of the BJP, including the Honorable Home Minister on the floor of India's parliament, the unfinished business of India's partition. Um, so identifying so-called illegal infiltrators, uh, possibly deporting them to Bangladesh is likely to destabilize relations between the two countries. 
resulting in wider regional instability. Bangladesh may well remain reluctant to join the Indo-Pacific security umbrella if it perceives unfair population pressures from India. And obviously under these circumstances, the prospects for a free and open Indo-Pacific will remain remote. So I'm sorry to have to end on um, such a somber note, but that's what I have to say. Um, hopefully the Q&A will bring up uh, themes that one can be more hopeful about. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for a, a very interesting sort of uh, canvas, the regional canvas, you know, the broader questions that you've raised, uh, especially in relation to Indo-Pacific and what can happen uh, if uh, certain political parties can <clears throat> actually get uh, to grips with power in Bengal. So that's quite speculations, a lot of speculations there, and, and we can take this up um, later. But, you know, uh, we, we do have uh, Dr. Sabir Sinha here, who is an expert on emerging forms of politics, if I can say that to you, Sabir, uh, the senior lecturer for in institutions and development in SOAS. And you're going to talk about West Bengal election campaign as civil war and how the BJP creates its support base. Uh, Savir also has recent publications in the Geo Forum on Modi's authoritarian populism, open democracy, as well as the conversation on the use of social media and digital communications to consolidate the BJP's support base while disintegrating that of his opponents. So I leave it to you, Savir, to take on. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sanjukta, and the other panelists uh, from whose uh, presentations I've learned a lot. And thanks also to the 43 attendees uh, who have decided to spend their evening uh, listening to us. Uh, for anyone who's following the campaign at the moment in Bengal, and in fact, obviously, the few rounds of uh, voting that have already happened, uh, this is a time of high anxiety, to say the least. Uh, one can see uh, following social media uh, that there are people who are celebrating premature victories. There are other people who are lamenting premature defeats. Uh, there is hope one day and despair the next day, depending on how they believe uh, the previous round of elections or the campaign itself has happened so far. And to my mind, this is actually very much a part of politics as we have come to experience it from 2014 onwards, where there is a very high emotional pitch to political campaigning. And that is partly because of the fact that the reigning model of politics that we have both nationally uh, with Mr. Modi and within Bengal with uh, Mamta Banerjee is basically of a certain kind of a populist uh, genre. And within populism, uh, what one can basically think of is that polarization between supporters of one political party and the nomination of other social groups, which are not a part of this coalition, as the enemies of that particular camp, uh, that has effectively become the norm for it, uh, you know, uh, Indian political campaigns uh, going back, uh, well, at least seven or eight years. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, we have heard the term Bengali exceptionalism, uh, and, you know, perhaps that will come up later in the conversation as well. But what I basically want to suggest is that what we are seeing in the Bengal campaign of the BJP, and that is uh, the campaign that I'll primarily be focusing on, is that they have a kind of a national template that they have then perfected to some extent in tweaking so as to be able to take regional specificities or state-oriented specificities. Now, the other element of their campaign is that the BJP's campaigns are very long campaigns. Uh, you know, the campaign for 2021 literally started in 2016, one could say, uh, you know, not so much even in 2014. And one could even say that the current campaign that we are looking at is the culmination or, and the most perfected form really of the BJP in, in campaign mode. So what is basically going on here is that since 2016, uh, you know, Bengal has remained, has always been a long sought after prize 
uh, for the BJP. It is so counterintuitive that the BJP will actually win Bengal that it, this particular achievement, if it was to happen, would be a very major triumph for the BJP. So from 2016, uh, when they lost, well, you know, when they didn't do that well in that particular state election, uh, the RSS increased its, its, its presence within Bengal uh, quite significantly. It identified places and social groups that they wanted to win to their side. Uh, and also, you know, targeted and identified individuals within various political parties that could be either arm twisted or induced to defect uh, on the basis that they had information about their uh, goings on financially or corruption. Uh, so we have seen a lot of movement effectively going on from uh, other political parties initially, uh, you know, and that is sort of an overall trend as well. Uh, Maitresh pointed to much more specific trends, if I could only point to a, a overall general trend, that there's been a shift effectively from the support base uh, in some areas, and one has to speculate uh, in terms of how large that has been uh, from the CPM initially to the TMC, and then in the last uh, couple of uh, rounds of local elections and 2019 elections, the so-called bomb to Ram, you know, uh, movement that uh, people seem uh, to be referring to, uh, and, and which makes us uncomfortable and, and perhaps points to the very fluid nature of politics where political allegiances that were solidified for some time have effectively come unstuck. And one can see that also uh, as something not only peculiar to Bengal, but also something that has seen, that one has seen, uh, you know, as a, as a basis for BJP's victories in, in, in other states where they've been able to uh, break up the consolidated, uh, you know, kind of uh, support base for other, you know, uh, for other political formations. We've also obviously seen, uh, you know, since uh, the 2018 uh, Panchayat Tiraj elections and then in 2019, a really very alarming and steady decline. Obviously, the Congress's decline has been much more, you know, kind of long term, but of the CPM, so that the political field right now appears to be effectively polarized between the B BJP and the TMC. I mean, yes, we know that this is a sort of three cornered contest and so forth, but, uh, uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm aware that, uh, you know, both the, INC, uh, the Congress and the CPM Alliance uh, has pockets of strength. But if you were to just watch the media, and if you were to watch the social media, uh, effectively the election has been reduced in these two media as if the other third element does not exist. And that can have both a, a, an interesting positive effect for the third sort of front, as well as a negative one. Uh, the positive one, of course, is that it allows them to operate a little bit under the radar. Uh, the negative one, of course, which again, uh, Maitrish, um, you know, alluded to, which is that if people become convinced that that is a wasted vote, uh, then as we know from electoral studies from around the world, uh, especially those who have not yet decided, uh, you know, might uh, want to go with the side that they believe is the winning side rather than the third front, which might have other attractive elements, particularly uh, given the fact that there is anti-incumbency. So the long campaign of the BJP that I'm talking about, uh, and especially social media, uh, is something that we need to think about. I mean, you know, the BJP obviously is the first party to have uh, gotten uh, familiar with social media and to have basically um, checked out the so-called technological affordances of social media uh, for the purposes of electioneering. Uh, the other po political parties are really much, much later uh, in terms of how they have arrived and how, how, how late they are in this particular game. Uh, I remember conversations with particularly CPM people from 2014 onwards, trying to convince them that social media was in fact a terrain that they needed to take more seriously, only to be met with considerable derision that, uh, you know, that is not how real politics or grassroots politics actually operates. So it has been, I think, to the BJP's advantage that every other political party has been so late in figuring out the uh, full potentialities of social media, uh, both in terms of uh, the creation of an alternative narrative in a scenario where mainstream national media is so heavily one-sided towards the BJP, uh, and also in terms of creating, you know, sort of uh, electoral mobilization and things like that. So 
uh, a kind of ground has been ceded to the BJP on the social media. I mean, we know the nature of India's corporate media, uh, especially at the national level. So one doesn't really expect that they will have anything like a, you know, kind of uh, fair uh, kind of, you know, coverage of this particular election or a level playing ground. The other element here is the fact that, you know, if you take a look at the heterogen, uh, moving from the sort of regional to the national level, and the kind of a general kind of Hindutva, which the BJP has been uh, looking to implement in, in the case of Bengal. And yes, we know that they have, you know, paid a lot of, uh, you know, uh, attention to regional specificities, particularly Matua Namashudra issues that uh, Professor uh, Shekhar Bandopadhyay has referred to. But also keep in mind that they brought in some general Hindutva slogans, this whole thing of Jai, Jai Shri Ram uh, as a slogan that has had some traction within Bengal, uh, to my surprise, as it turns out, I come from the neighboring state of uh, Bihar, where even Jai Shri Ram, uh, you know, is still not a sort of uh, particularly uh, popular slogan, given that even our sort of gods and goddesses in Bihar are not the same as those of uh, you know, which find uh, favor within the Hindu um, campaign. We have found large numbers of uh, well-known com communal campaigners being brought into Bengal over the last several years. Uh, Yogi Adityanath or Tejasvi Surya, uh, Tajinder Singh Bagga, uh, people who are well-known to be, uh, you know, uh, folks with a record of uh, extreme speech and those who have actually taken street side action in terms of creating Hindu-Muslim polarization. In all of this, it's been quite interesting to me to look at an Indian, India, uh, Indian Express uh, sort of uh, data set from last week, where they were looking to compare where, uh, states in which people identify as, uh, you know, belonging primarily to a state versus the national identity. And I was quite surprised to see that at this point, only 22% of Bengalis were reported to think of themselves as Bengalis first, and uh, sorry, as, as, as Bengalis first, the, the, you know, the rest of them or a large uh, number of the rest of them identify as national rather than as Bengali. How that will play out electorally, I don't know. But certainly it seems to me that that is one effect that the current social media blitz has, um, you know, resulted in. So apart from the massive amount of fake news circulating via social media, and apart from that fake news also uh, identifying uh, you know, Mamta Banerjee as basically a Muslim, uh, we also have seen a large number of social media campaigns which have had, you know, kind of polarizing elements within that. And you see the thing with social media, it's not just the fact that so many people use it. From what I understand, from at least 2018 onwards, the BJP has spent an enormous amount of money on creating social media networks within uh, Bengal. So for example, you know, people have been hired who are not particularly ideological, uh, but had skills in the social media and they were given very well paid jobs to create uh, WhatsApp groups from 20, for the 2019 elections. And of course they will have advantages to that. And if you look at the uh, overwhelming advantage that the BJP has enjoyed on social media, that is matched by its overwhelming uh, advantage in many other spheres as well, massive amounts of cash speculations of up to 90% of the expenditure on the Bengal elections coming from the BJP, which of course, you know, we are not entirely, uh, you know, able to see. We saw the 1000 rupees coupons. Uh, I've heard of the Bhat Mang Show meals being served. I know of the 250 rupee coupons given to two wheeler uh, riders so that they can fill petrol at the pump. Uh, and now we see these uh, gifts which are being, you know, sent around. You open a card and as you open the card, you can hear Mr. Modi speak these things don't come cheap. So where is this money coming from? And the fact that you've had such a massive infusion of cash in the Bengal election, I think is totally unprecedented. And it gives a kind of a feeling which is slightly counterintuitive. If the BJP was really on such a strong wicket, would it have to do this amount of pouring of cash and effectively skirting on the other side of the boundary of the model code of conduct with the uh, distribution of coupons and so on and so forth. Obviously, they also have a massive advantage in terms of institutions. Uh, less said the better about the election commission, 
But you know, the whole sort of coercive apparatus of the state, CBI, NIA, ED, et cetera, charges against people, the creation of a certain perception just before polling day by using agencies in, you know, to, to uh, make opponents appear as if they are on the verge of arrest. You can also see in terms of the policing arrangements for this particular election with the uh, entry of the UP police and of the CRPF, uh, changes within Bengal police itself. We, we, for example, you know, one can point to the suspension of uh, Vivek Sahai, the uh, IG of police. So there's a whole range of things which are going on, uh, which, which basically give the impression of a very uh, skewed political field and so on. Take again the use of violence. You know, it's not just by making appeals in words that new political constituencies get created. What we see from 2018, 2019 are waves of violence, the center of which have been prominent members of the BJP, many of whom are contesting the elections, whether it is Jadavpur, Shanti Niketan, Calcutta University, the Vidya Sagar statue destruction, and so on and so forth. Now, you know, violence is not a monopoly of the BJP, nor is it new in Bengal politics, as far as this particular election is concerned. We have seen that in the past by the CPM and also by the TMC. But what violence does is that it is a consolidating of the base of the parties, as well as the othering of the political opponent in such a way that violence becomes not a substitute for politics, but it becomes a primary mode of doing politics. You can see that, for example, in the rhetoric of someone like Dilip Ghosh or other uh, members uh, you know, of the BJP currently contesting the elections, where open threats of pure gundagardi about beating up opponents are now part of relatively open political rhetoric. Uh, I will not, uh, I was planning to say something about uh, the Matua Namshul, but I think people have said far uh, deeper things than I was capable of. So I'm, I'm going to withdraw from, from that particular conversation. Hopefully, if it comes up later, I'll, I'll come up, uh, you know, I might contribute. Um, on the issue of corruption, and you know, that again sort of uh, tangentially refers to a point that Maitrish raised about the uh, paradox of uh, growth uh, slowing down, but consumption remaining stable or even increasing, which it seems to me is a quite interesting way to think in terms of corruption and counter uh, and, and um, anti-incumbency. Is it the case that on the issue of subsidies, uh, welfare programs, uh, programs basically that allow people to subsist, uh, that there is not much anti-incumbency on that? Could we take anti-incumbency itself as a block term rather than as terms which can be disaggregated? So for example, corruption over uh, Amfan relief, uh, but perhaps less when it comes to the distribution of certain kinds of welfare measures, because it seems to me that this is politically and electorally consequential. Uh, people are reading, perhaps too much, I don't know, that large numbers of women coming out to vote uh, perhaps points to, uh, you know, Mamta's advantage in terms of some of the welfare measures that she has been able to, um, you know, implement. I want to sort of refer briefly to the figure of Modi. Uh, why does the figure of Modi have traction in Bengal? This is something to think about and perhaps to discuss because, you know, as it has been pointed out, the record of the man in office is very poor in, in many respects. Failure on the economy, corona containment, uh, the fact that employment itself has, you know, uh, not been his strong uh, suit. Uh, and, you know, the entire persona, uh, the beard, it's a bit surreal to try to appear like Rabindranath Tagore in Bengal, I think is, is, is for most observers from the outside appears to be very strange. Uh, not only that, uh, attempts to speak uh, Bangla are, you know, for, for, for those of us uh, from the outside, that also appears to be very strange. So then you look at the visuals. Some places the rallies are empty, other places the, uh, the rallies are full. Uh, for some rallies, we have fake and morphed photos of crowds circulated on social media. But at the same time, both on social media and on national media, there has been the creation of a narrative of his uh, invincibility. One thing that comes relatedly to mind is why we have not seen 
or at least we have not heard of in the media or even in social media, the economic issues becoming electoral issues. If we look at all of the previous speakers uh, that have spoken, uh, there's been, a, or not all of them, but you know, there has been a lot of em emphasis on caste issues, which of course I think is a relevant and an important one. But given the fact that we saw during the corona lockdown, large numbers of migrant workers from Bengal, uh, why migrant workers issues have not become a very major political issue or electoral issue, I think is, is worth thinking about. Why Modi's claims that he's going to be able to provide jobs or development have not been challenged in the political rhetoric or on social media, uh, it seems to me is yet another question to be looked at as to why exactly uh, you know, we are basically focusing on the communal issue and the caste issue, which are, you know, extremely important in their own right, but why not so much on the class issue as well as on the issue of, uh, you know, things that also matter, jobs, for example, or the way in which uh, migrant workers, and we know that Bengal has among some of the, you know, pockets of grave poverty, some of the poorest blocks in the country. So these things should have had more traction, and I wonder if the political parties have kind of walked into a BJP trap of making this election much more about identity than about uh, bread and butter issues and the record of the BJP in governing the economy uh, such as they have. Uh, I just want to close now to think in terms of the momentum. If you think in terms of the momentum at the moment, uh, and if you were to look at the momentum issue from uh, the point of view of the fact that several rounds of the election have already taken place, uh, one would get a view just watching media and social media that the momentum has been with the BJP. But momentum itself is not an objective thing. Momentum is created in order for the momentum to be able to have a consequence on the political behavior of the voters who are yet to vote. So one very important element on the question of momentum is whether the political parties and their supporters, which are, with, which are against the BJP, the TMC, as well as the Congress and the, uh, it's, uh, the uh, CPM and its alliance, uh, whether this momentum is something that can be potentially challenged and whether this momentum is something which is losing out of uh, steam. We are only halfway through uh, the elections four more rounds of voting are to be held. Uh, we know that the BJP had ma major problems uh, with uh, the selection of candidates and riots and disturbances broke out in their district level offices when the names of candidates were announced. So in this context, to think of this election and its outcome as loaded in the favor of the BJP, it seems to me is quite premature. And therefore, not really on a hopeful note, but on a note of being, of quizzing this particular momentum narrative, let me stop and say, uh, you know, with my last sort of question, which is, what are political parties at the moment thinking, which can change the narrative of the momentum heading in the direction of the BJP? Thanks very much. That's great, Savir. Thank you so much uh, for, you know, sort of break, break, bringing this on and up for, on a different note, I would say, you know, the momentum narrative that you've, you've kind of uh, established. And, and uh, I mean, I can't help but think of um, another session, perhaps, where, you know, you can really talk of comparisons between states. Uh, you can see how the development narrative works, for example, in Orissa. But, um, and, and also, you know, if we take uh, Indrajit's point about the larger story of the regional imbalances and all that, then of course it all ties up with the question of what do we prioritize, you know, work, development. And I just had a conversation with a journalist and I was saying that, you know, in Nundigram, there were lots of promises were made for development and really it hasn't had uh, the chance to pick up instead. It is now um, a politics between the switch from Trinamool to joining uh, BJP at the very last minute, and therefore it's it's a policy or it's a politics of reaction rather than you're playing the card on the politics of development here. 
And that has been the kind of, you know, the underlying theme of this discussion today, that state versus center uh, to create this kind of an all uh, uh, overarching Akhanda Bharat narrative of nationalism, which is also hyper-nationalism, as you've said in, on other occasions. And that is again uh, facilitated by the advantage of the social media that, that you've raised. And whether that narrative stands for Bengal, which is very much, just the other day we had Kobir Shuman on another social forum and he was saying that, you know, I am a Bengali, my Bengali language matters. So we, we do have a history of ethnic nationalism quite strong in Bengal. And those kind of stories are getting uh, perhaps changing, the momentum is changing, the di it's getting diluted. And let's hear about the grassroots story now uh, slightly, but we do have six questions. And I, I, I'm really going to say that, you know, as, as a gatekeeper of time, I think I thought we will all be able to squeeze in, but the discussion has been so interesting and so good that I didn't want to stop anybody and, and maybe keep up the momentum there. But if we can just take some questions and I would say to speakers, if you can just keep that within a few lines, uh, your, your replies, then we can really see some hope of doing some justice to the second uh, round of panelists really waiting very patiently. So um, there's a question to Salim, I'm not sure if he's still with us. Um, but uh, I think I think I'll I'll skip that for the moment and say Yes, I'm here. Yes, oh, I'm here. here okay, thank you. I'm trying to this. see if you are there. So um, it says, given the majority of media has turned the election into a binary one, that is TMC versus BJP, and as the social media narrative have been proven to be successful in creating this polarization. How does the Shongjukto Morcha plans, comes to my name really, have managed to convince voters at the grassroots level that to stop BJP, TMC is not the only choice and vice versa. So do you have a quick answer? To be very brief, <clears throat> very brief, as one of the speakers have already pointed out, the BJP started the last five years they're doing this job and media also after the 2019 election, they started scripting the result of 2021. And it was a binary, dual binary. On the, politically, it is BJP versus Tenamul, and in the social front, it's Hindu versus Muslims. Both these binaries were active. But even then, after this brigade rally of the Sanjukta Murcha was announced, where even the photograph of the CPI left rally was uh, you know, stolen by the IT cell. So media is now talking about this third force. Of course, hesitantly, but they were not seen, not written, uh, not heard of all these years. But since this pressure from the grassroots level, the rallies, the grassroots level activism, uh, you will see that the every election campaign, uh, the media, you cannot buy the media space. And as you know, the character of this corporate media, but even in social media, even though negative, they started doing negative thing, but why ISF? Why left joining hands with the Indian Secular Front? Uh, they started talking about secularism. All those media which are talking about secularism, they never really wrote uh, secularism, but they used to term as a secular because of the IT cell. And thirdly, I'm, the, the street level movement is going on, village level movement is going on. And that has broken this binary because some of the speakers pointed out last speaker that livelihoods. So the left was always, since beginning, we think that if the issues of livelihoods come first, then this consciousness is developed. And because of unemployment, because of the plight of the migrant level, because of the soaring price rise, particularly fuels and essential commodities, the people are discussing something else. You cannot see in the discussion in the evening hours, the television studio. They are far off from the rural Bengal. One point is there, and then the Bengal ethos and culture. During election, you may, may make or break a political party's future. But uh, five years gone, you can elect. But culture, ethos, these are bit of centuries. So this BJP Jaisiram, maybe you you are not listening 
uh, on the streets. You are listening on the BJP rallies and or some PLC rallies as a counter narrative and and the media. But I'm moving around Bengal. How, how many places you are hearing this? We are not. But media is focusing. So time is out. My question was there about post full alliance. That admittedly, Mamta Banerjee herself says that there are gaddars still in our party. So the naturalize of BJP, the estranged allies of BJP. If the fight is between the BJP and its estranged allies or natural allies, then that binary media is created in front of favor in favor of BJP. But you have a large section of population in Bengal who are not with BJP, who don't think BJP is their natural life, and that is the strength of the left, and that is the strength of the third force. Thank you, Salim. Thank you for your response. I think that sums up quite well uh, the, the question. And I think um, we have a next one that is not really addressed to anybody, but let me just go to something that's addressed to Moitish from Shugoto Ghosh. Do you think perceptions of the growth versus retribution issue could be important in deciding the outcome of the West Bengal elections? And if so, which of the three parties is it likely to benefit most? Um, anything that you can quickly think of? Uh, thanks, Shugatu, for that question. I, I, I assume you mean redistribution, not retribution, although you know one can never uh, rule out, um, you know, uh, different angles in these very strange and, and dramatic elections. Uh, but I assume it is a growth versus redistribution. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's a fair question. I think that uh, really if one takes a very objective look at things, leaving aside the political uh, angles and, and, and opinions, I think clearly, uh, especially uh, given, I think, the first round of the coronavirus crisis and then the migrant worker is coming back and then the AMFAN, the, uh, uh, you know, the natural, uh, uh, you know, the devastation that AMFAN caused, caused and the relief, there was a lot of allegation of irregularities, etc. I think there was a little bit of a, 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 a ground under the feet of Trinomol was a little shaken at that time. I think the general perception, and I'm really going by uh, conversations with uh, various um, um, informed sources as well as what I read. Uh, since I would say the last six to eight months, there has been some uh, concerted effort with the uh, Shastra Shathi and some of these other schemes. And therefore going back to that, you know, that's in a way also plays to the earlier uh, kind of perception of, of the Trinomul as basically dole giving, whether it's the puja committees and the uh, clubs of the Paras who, who uh, you know, essentially um, get this. So there is a little bit of, a, you know, in, in an ironic way, uh, that um, uh, you know, many of us here would support a strong social safety net or welfare, and I, I have nothing uh, against that. But uh, we would also support that to be given out in a systematic and, and well-designed way, and 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 not in the way of political patronage, etc. Right. So therefore, uh, so therefore, I think that does play to the Trinomul's advantage to some degree. However, interestingly, on the growth issue. Um, one of the reasons for the Puriborton slogan that it seemed to have worked in 2011, clearly it worked out electorally, was there was frustration in the second half of the left front's rule. In fact, I, my early career work on Operation Borga, Panchayat, etc., uh, you know, um, uh, that basically showed that the rural reforms were quite successful in West Bengal. You know, one can always draw the various nuances and 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 kind of you know, uh, but the reality is, you know, these reforms were relatively successful. And, and the left front gained from that popularity in the rural areas, right? But in the later decades, uh, the industrial growth, employment prospects, et cetera, there was a problem. There was a certain uh, uh, kind of you know, frustration that was setting in. And that clearly it was the same frustration that, for example, sunk the UPA too in a way, that there was this perception of, of kind of you know, stagnation and then Modi had the magic button that would give you know, high, high growth rates, et cetera. So going back to Shukato's uh, question, I think that this is the, so uh, in, a, in a certain way, the redistribution narrative normally should help the left because I think the left 
uh, does have a very strong uh, uh, electoral uh, discussion and focus around some of these roti roji type uh, you know issues and and it's to their credit that they're doing it uh, and and not getting in the various identity uh, and and kind of uh, divisive issues that we are we are also hearing but the fact is that trinomul does have certain schemes that seem to have worked well and and especially uh, among female voters they might play a role but interestingly and I'll, I'll stop with the statement on the growth issue though if this was 2014 uh, the uh, gujarat model uh, whatever that bubble that was floated and clearly some people you know i i wrote an article in outlook that uh, ended with a somewhat uh, whatever pessimistic thing that uh, as 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 with commercial bubbles or corporate sector bubbles you know the trouble with bubbles is unless they're backed by fundamentals at some point they have to you know they they will burst because you know any any growth episode has to be backed up by solid infrastructure investment solid kind of uh, you know climate for industrial investment etc so in 2021 where is the growth where is the growth i mean you know so therefore to the extent normally it would have played in the bjp rhetoric right that there's a party of growth the party of opportunity at least that's one part of the uh, sort of two sided messaging that they have on the economic front it's kind of a kind of robust kind of growth kind of thing as opposed to welfare and then of course uh, the more identity politics issue but anyway that's 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 what i have to say thank you Uh, I mean you know this the, the the topics are so big you could probably speak for a long time on growth as well and and whether uh, growth stands anymore as the magic word you know this is something that uh, we can talk on later perhaps um there's a question that uh, comes from Nilanjan Banerjee uh, which um I think uh, probably Suveer can probably take this is mamta banerji following nitish kumar's model of getting large number of votes from women voters which even many pollsters could not predict with its welfare schemes for women and consciously made campaigns like bangla nijer meki chai and the insider outsider debate just a camouflage to it um that's a question from nilanjan banerji and i think there is another one that i would like to read out uh probably indrajit you could take this um daipan choudhury who is writing does the amendment of recent caa pave the way for creation of an ethnic democracy in south asia as sami smuha would have put it given how there's a political bonhomie between the hindu nazi state and the zionist israeli state oh i leave that so uh, so where do you want to take first and then perhaps indrajit can answer the yeah, yeah maitresh uh, obviously you know already addressed part of that one but you know it's not just mamta or nitish kumar who are uh, who have targeted programs for women voters i mean you know you look across the country and one interesting trend of uh, redistributive if you want to call it that you know more, uh, programs from around the country have been programs that have been directed specifically for women if whether it is nitish kumar handing out bicycles among other things a girls education kutumbashri in kerala or the programs that uh, you know uh, have been implemented for example to induce uh, families to not marry their daughters below the age of 18 by mamta for example if you are 18 and above uh you can prove your age certificate you get i think 25000 rupees at the time of your wedding and those programs are meaningful and so that is why i basically want to reiterate that you know whole point the anti incumbency i think is a kind of overall catch all umbrella term but it needs to be looked at in a much more disaggregated way it is possible that there are people who were badly affected by amfan but then benefited from some of the other programs uh it is possible that so you know th- these kinds of combinations make it difficult to just say corruption in all programs or programs have been successful and i think that is the unknowable here what what one does take a you know i think uh, if, uh, from people from within the tmc uh one hears that large numbers of women coming out to vote in one place you know including for example in nandigram which had a in any case high high you know vote vote turnout that these are seen as silent way, you know uh, support for uh, apparently a beleaguered chief minister thank you sovir 
Indrajit, would you like to take the other question? Of course. of course, yeah, I think it's a good question. Uh, and uh, a lot of scholars have started using the concept of ethnic democracy to describe India. Uh, Christoph Jaffrelot, for instance, talks about the key feature of an ethnic democracy and it's associated what he calls two-tiered citizenship, where the Hindu majority enjoys a more de jure and de facto rights uh, than the Muslim minority. Uh, you also have Catherine Adeny, who's uh, writing about how the Hindu nationalists define the ethno-religious majority as eternal heir to India's uh, sort of uh, cultural legacy. Now, while the formulation of ethnic democracy is quite useful and it cautions against accepting India as a liberal democracy, but I think it also downplays the extent to which democracy in India is reduced to a shell uh, of just holding regular elections. So I think that democracy in the ethnic democracy bit is a bit problematic because if you have a polity that is based on the structural exclusion of a section of its population, it does not reasonably can be said to qualify as a democracy. So I think an alternative conception uh, that I'm um, sort of uh, playing with, if, I, if, if you will, is uh, the concept of ethnocracy, um, which is a very specific expression of nationalism where a dominant ethnos, in our case, the Hindu ethnos, so to speak, and the way in which a religious community has been ethnified um, as uh, has happened in, in, our, in, in the Indian case, gains political control and uses the state apparatus to ethnicize the territory. And here, of course, you have the CAA in place, but you also have the various other expressions of what used to be called Hindu nationalism, but I think is much more a way of ethnifying um, what is uh, you know, quite a diverse and, if you will, a hierarchical uh, worldview uh, and sort of in, ensure that it's the Hindu ethnos that really gains uh, control and dominance. Uh, and is considered to be at the core of the nation, whereas groups such as Muslims are considered peripheral and external to the nation. And of course, the CAA is a classic example. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think there are two more questions that have come out. And um, I mean, you know, I, I really feel that the question that comes from Abhishek Banerjee on the feminist angle and how women are seeing things change, I don't know whether Salim is still here to, to perhaps respond slightly as to what, um, you know, you were talking a lot on culture and how um, the, the whole CPM campaign has been uh, revolving around, um, you know, a lot of songs, a lot of music, and a lot of, uh, you know, whether that has encouraged more women to come out and participate in the campaigns and whether they've responded more favorably, that could be one thing. Um, and there's another question, which is again a much more general question from Shurmish Tapal. Given the lumpenization of politics, do you see voters voicing against this? So there's not a particular party that's implied here. And do you expect to see Bengal voters punishing the defectors, criminal politicians? I think the defectors are not all criminal politicians. There's been a lot of defections here for various reasons. Um, so I think um, I, I just keep that open to anybody who wants to reply to this. Um, but maybe Salim, you have a, you've raised your hand, so I'll, I'll move to you for, for a quick reply. Yeah, thank you. Now, while this discussion was going on about women voters, you forget about the younger, the new generation. And this left campaign is not only youthful, but it's driven by the youth. There's no IT cell no PK or IPAC. It's just young volunteers, students, teens, mainly the 18 to 25, and both male and female. You see that picture of the rally, though it's not published or shown in the ABP and all that. But you will find out in the social media, whole lots of things. So creativity used, technology driven, and it's very much Bengali, uh, parody, uh, cartoon, graffiti, slogans, poetry, and this is why it's not just one or two individuals are doing it. It's a whole lot of generation has come out. And that is it. It is seen on the streets, in the campaigns. So it, it, this is revigored, uh, reinvigorated youth, uh, uh, youth campaign, one thing. And that includes both male and female again. Of course, elderly people 
I can't say objectively because most of the studies, uh, particularly the women uh, with children with so much of burden of the family, uh, what kind of this Swasasati and Shukhanyasri is going to help that. But the young generation, they have firmly said that they don't want to depend on those. Even in Singur, I've seen that. So you get two rupees rice, that's not enough. They want industry. They want trade, commerce to flourish. This one part I can, I can add on this. And this entire Bengal is not lost on this Hindu Muslim battle. There are Muslims who are opposing this Mangka kind of uh, quote unquote as regularly focused by RSS appeasement thing, but Muslims are not appeased in Bengal. You see this real situation. So in the neighborhood, people are seeing it from far. You can see through tele those who see telegraphically Bengal or those who see telescopically Bengal, they can have a, a you know a particular view, but the neighborhood. People are seeing how the sufferings are common, Suffer, uh, common suffering, and then defections. Uh, unfortunately, this Mokul Roy Mamta kind of politics have legalized and normalized this defection. But in, uh, there is hate in, uh, in among the Bengalis about this uh, Dalbad. So that's what the slogan is: Dal Badal Nai Din Badal. Then our left voters are coming back. I can tell you. So don't, in all these opinion polls, their base is 2019. So please, instead of 2019, you can go back to 2016 or you may not, but don't depend on 2019. That will be uh, the basic mistake uh, that I can Okay, thank you so much. So maybe we should keep with the momentum narrative. May, may, I, may I take leave now? Just thank tomorrow you. morning I have to go early. Thank you once again, Salim, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you back again, perhaps another time. And, and again, uh, thank you again from uh, all of us, as well as the South Asia Institute. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to close this session now and move on to the next session, because I think there are some questions still, uh, unless someone is very keen to, um, to, to answer any of this. I think there is a there's a question on NRC, uh, whether is communal violence guaranteed? Should BJP win state and implement CA and NRC? And um, you know how much violence is going on in the election campaign? I think these sort of questions, as well as another question on the Love Jihad campaign, I think these kind of questions can come up in the next session when we will hear a little bit more on subaltern and grassroots um, narratives, as well as uh, on the social media.